All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, we once again uh, like to thank you all for, for joining us tonight, um, and thank you especially to people who have been um, coming regularly these last uh, couple months. Um, <laughs> we very much uh, appreciate the continued support. Um, I'd also like to, to again thank um, the Communication Studies Department for their support of this series, as well as the politics and government, support, uh, government department's uh, support as well. Uh, just to introduce myself briefly, my name is uh, Dr. Michael Artime. Uh, I help coach the debate team here, um, and I am an adjunct instructor at Tacoma Community College, and this is my friend Mike. Hi, I'm Mike Purdy. I am a uh, Seattle-based presidential historian, and um, I've got a blog on presidential history, which those of you who have been here know about that. And you can sign up for a free email subscription to that if that's something you're interested in. There's a lot of resources about the 2016 election there. And um, we've also been putting videos of these sessions online. So if you have to miss, uh, if you missed some of them, um, or you have friends who want to watch them, they are all online there. You know, when Michael and I uh, first kind of conceived this idea of this series, we thought, you know, if we do six sessions, you know, ending in late April, it should be fine. Everything will be settled. We'll kind of know what's going on. <laughs> well, this has been a little bit different than what we all thought. It's been kind of unprecedented. And um, so we're going to do one more bonus yeah. lecture. <laughs> And so we picked June 7th um, because that is the date of the last primaries. And we will know a lot on that date, especially on the Republican side, whether we're going to be moving into a brokered or contested convention or whether Donald Trump's going to win on the first ballot. And so uh, June 7th will be kind of a combination of we'll, we'll do a little bit of lecturing um, in terms of kind of recapping where we're at. And we will then, um, we'll make our predictions. And we'll also, um, we'll watch what the results are, the primary results as they're coming in. And just have a lot of opportunity for dialogue and questions and answers. So we'll do it from uh, 7 to 9 in this room here. And come for whatever part of it you um, can make. And uh, so that'll be good. Now, we've also talked about should we do more? Um, should we do something around the convention time or maybe something in the fall? We don't know yet. So we're going to pass out a, um, a sign-up sheet uh, for your name and email address. And if you want to be notified if we're going to do additional lectures. We'll also try to get publicity out on that. But in the event you don't see that publicity and you want to have us email you about future lectures beyond the June 7th one, uh, go ahead and uh, sign that. And they're, they're passing out the sign-in sheets um, at the aisles, and you just pass them down to sign in if you're interested in that. So the other week, how many of you saw uh, KBTC's Northwest Now? Anybody see it? Okay, so, so Michael and I were actually on the show uh, with Tim Layson uh, for about 25 minutes talking about uh, brokered conventions, talking about the role of money, talking about... Um, the, the, the level of rhetoric in this, pro, in this campaign. So a number of things. Very interesting conversation. So if you're interested, you can uh, take a look at that. You can see the website address there, or just search for KBTC Northwest Now, and you can find the video that way. So about 25 minutes of that. So we have a, uh, a tradition here, uh, looking at the long and dishonorable tradition of presidential insults. And, you know, the interesting thing is that I, I think we really have a lot more um, insults now. We've always had insults in campaigns. Um, but the level of viciousness this year, I think, is unprecedented. And, um, you know, we've got candidates without any filter at all. <laughs> And then the other thing that's uh, different about this one, I think, is the visibility of these comments. So social media is the way in which to um, you know, get those comments out. 
So I want to uh, show you about five or six different quotes. Um, most of them are from history. There's one from current day. So his principles are all subordinate to his ambitions. Who said it? Any ideas? This is historical. This is actually John Adams talking about Martin Van Buren. Okay. Worst liar, crazy, or very dishonest? Guesses? Is this, the one? this is the modern day one. <laughs> this is Donald Trump on Ted Cruz. Now, just to keep with the uh, lying theme, <laughs> a congenital liar, this is history now, a con congenital liar. This is Dwight Eisenhower talking about Harry Truman. So they said bad things back then, too. A hot-headed executive. That's James Madison talking about John Adams. And John Adams was kind of, you know, hot-headed. He was kind of in-your-face um, kind of guy. A playboy. Lyndon Johnson on John F. Kennedy. Okay. So, let's take a look at what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, tonight's topic is uh, how accurate are the polls? And before we get to that, we're going to do a recap like we've done before about, you know, who's still left in the race and what's going to happen and uh, what has happened with various primary and caucus results. Um, but we're going to look at the impact of the polls. What do the polls do? So in other words, there are some unintended consequences oftentimes of polls. Polls are intended to be a snapshot in time of public opinion. But there's some unintended consequences that we'll look at. We'll look at polling methodology. How do they work? Uh, we'll look at some new developments in polling. Uh, and we'll look at the failure of polls, both in the past as well as we've, we've got at least one uh, current model of uh, failure in polls. And then we'll look at election forecasting, which is a little bit different than polling, but different methods to determine how do we predict uh, what the outcomes are going to be. So that's kind of our agenda for tonight. So, no change since last time. Same cast of characters still running and likely to probably stick with it until the conventions. So what happens if we, there's a lot of different scenarios here, right? So Jesse Ventura has said that if Bernie Sanders does not get the Democratic nomination, that he is going to go for the Libertarian nomination. Now he's got to fight for that too, because he's got competition. So you got uh, Ventura out there. You have um, many people in the Republican Party saying, um, if there's a brokered or contested convention, um, should they pick one of the three candidates running? Should they pick another candidate who has run? Or should they pick a white knight? So Paul Ryan has said, count me out. He will not accept the nomination. What about Mitt Romney? So that's a possibility. Um, there's other possibilities out there as well. There's also the possibility that if Trump wins the nomination, uh, there's been some concern by uh, GOP establishment figures that they may run a conservative candidate on a third party or an independent ticket. Now, to do that, time is running out. So to get on the ballot in all 50 states, every state has different rules and regulations about how to do that. Some are very early. So the window on getting on the ballot in Texas will close on May 9th. So that's well before the conventions. So we don't know what's going to happen. Trump has said that if he does not get the nomination, he might run as a third party or an independent candidate or a write-in candidate. So who knows what that's going to look like. Um, so a lot of variables that we simply do not know right now. So one of the things that has happened uh, since we last met is we had the Washington State Caucus. And um, Bernie Sanders won 
the, the caucus, a uh, higher percentage than Hillary Clinton. He got about um, 70, 72% to Clinton's 27% or so. Now, May 24th is the Republican primary in Washington State, and that will be the primary used to allocate the Republican delegates to the Republican convention. There will also be a Democratic primary on May 24th, but that Democratic primary is a beauty contest only. It's not going to have any impact on who gets the most delegates to the convention. That already happened with the caucus process. So I want to read you a quote. He was a populist who was known to television audiences. He won more primaries and more popular votes than any other candidate. By the time of the national convention, he was in the lead on delegates, but didn't have enough for the nomination on the first ballot. The party establishment didn't trust him and viewed him as a maverick, so they went looking for an alternate candidate. Who's that talking about? Reagan? No. Bingo! Estes Key Fowler, 1952. Why? Good job. So, Kefauver was a uh, Tennessee senator. Uh, he had been in the Senate just for a few years. Um, he had a television audience because he had run a series of um, uh, public hearings on organized crime. And so, television was just beginning to come in, and so he was kind of a television celebrity. He entered all 15 primaries, won 12 of them. So he goes into the convention, the Democratic convention, with the most delegates. Um, Adlai Stevenson, the governor of Illinois, said, I don't want to be a candidate for president. He finally got his arm twisted by the establishment, and he had his name placed in nomination. And on the third ballot, then, Adlai Stevenson won the nomination. Very, very similar set of facts to what we have today that you know, could play out uh, similarly. This is actually a, a quote from um, a recent blog that I did on my presidentialhistory.com blog um, about this scenario. So this is the introductory paragraph to it. So let's take a look at the candidates and where they stand right now. So there's really two ways in which we can evaluate uh, the candidate's progress toward the nomination. One would be to look at the target percentage. So in other words, what percent should they be at of gaining delegates um, in order to win the nomination on the first ballot? So Trump is at 92% of target. Now, that's a little bit less than what you see in the upper right-hand corner. That's what I showed you last time, where Trump was at 96%. So he was doing better before. He lost Wisconsin in the interim. Um, and, and Cruz has gone up 57% uh, from 53%. Now, Cruz's likelihood of winning on the first ballot is extremely remote. Um, you know, even if he won everything, he, he probably is not going to make it. Trump is the only one who has that possibility of winning on the first ballot. So the second way to look at um, how candidates are doing, besides where are they at in their target of meeting the delegates, would be to look at what percent of the remaining delegates do they need to win in order to win the nomination. And so for Donald Trump, uh, that would mean he needs to win 60% of the remaining delegates to win on the first ballot. Now, one of the things that could help Trump a lot is the number of winner-take-all states that are coming up. So if he wins some or all of those, and he's currently ahead in the polls in those, um, you know, winner-take-all is, even if you have just a plurality, you have more votes than anybody else, you get all of the delegates uh, for that state. So there's this discussion going on. Trump has, up to this point, not had a good organization, not a good ground game. Cruz has been working quietly behind the scenes on winning uh, delegates in individual states. So you remember, delegates are committed on the first ballot to vote for 
who their state went for or what percentage their state went for if it's a proportional state. But who the delegates actually are to the convention matters a whole lot on a second ballot or a third ballot. So for instance, in Colorado, which has no um, primary and no caucus, they simply select delegates. Cruz was very uh, strategic in getting those delegates to be loyal to him. So um, that, that's going to be to Cruz's benefit. After the first ballot in Cleveland, 59% of the delegates will become unbound or uncommitted. On the third ballot, 80% of the delegates are unbound or uncommitted. So that means things could change a lot. Uh, but having delegates who are loyal to a particular candidate is going to be very uh, critical. There's also the factor that Trump could end up losing delegates. So for example, in South Carolina, there's been discussion of him not getting the delegates that he won because he has come out and said that he wouldn't necessarily support the Republican nominee if it's not him. So um, there's a whole set of very complex and different rules for every state, which makes it very difficult to predict how this process is going to play out. On the Democratic side, it's a little bit simpler. Uh, there probably will not be a contested convention. Um, in terms of pledged delegates, uh, Hillary Clinton is at 107% of the target of where she should be at this point in time. Uh, that's down a little bit from 111%, but she's still the front runner. For Bernie Sanders to win the nomination, he would have to win 68% of all the remaining delegates. So that's something that's probably not going to happen, but uh, Sanders is, uh, I believe, in it for the long haul through the convention. You know, Clinton has won uh, 2.3 million uh, votes, which is more than anybody else. Um, now we've got New York coming up on Tuesday, which is going to be critical actually for both parties in terms of how, how they do. So here's the path forward. Here's the, the remaining uh, uh, primaries and caucuses that we have. So next Tuesday, New York. And then April 26, we've got uh, five states. Again, a number of winner-take-all states that are going to be critical. May 3rd, May 7th, May 10th. And then we move into to June, and, and the key one, I think, for the Republicans is going to be June 7th when we meet again here, and uh, California, which has the most number of delegates, that's going to be very critical since that is a winner-take-all state. So by the end of this month, you know, the Republicans will have chosen 79% of their delegates, and the Democrats 74%. By the end of May, that goes up to 80 and 87 percent by the end of June, they've selected all of them. So another way to look at the, the progress of the candidates, and we're talking about polling particularly tonight, <clears throat> is how are they doing in the polls? So again, polls are a snapshot in time. So this is the real clear politics average of polls, and Michael's going to talk a little bit about that as a as a tool later on. So Donald Trump, 39.3% as of today. Cruz, 31.5%. John Kasich, 20%. Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders are really neck and neck. This is an average of polling um, across the country. So another way to look at polls is to see if polls are a reflection of uh, public opinion at any given point in time. If we look at how have candidates' um, uh, popularity changed over time? So the, uh, the, the line at the, the top here, the blue line, is Trump. And uh, so he started down, if you track him down here, he's down at under 5% when he first announced um, in the summer. And, and he has gone up and up and up. The, the green is Jeb Bush, who kind of peaked in the summer, and then as he, as Trump rose, Bush went down. Uh, you've got the, um, the red of Carson, who at one point um, overtook Donald Trump in the polls. And then after the Paris bombings, Carson 
plummeted as there were lots of questions about his ability to handle foreign policy issues. Uh, Ted Cruz is the black line here, and if we follow this through the spaghetti down here, um, he, he looks like he starts out a little bit under 10%, but he has been steadily going up. Cruz has a good uh, ground game, good organization. Uh, we're going to be talking about that uh, a lot next time in terms of the importance of ground game in, um, in campaigns. So that gives you a little bit of a sense of the polls over a period of time, almost a year period of time. So I want to just ask a couple of questions about the impact of polls. Um, they're, they're somewhat rhetorical questions. So do polls impact actual voting? So, so in other words, does a poll result change people's opinions and they say, oh, well, everybody else is for this candidate, um, maybe I should be too. Which is kind of similar to this next one, the, do, do polls help build momentum or do they cause loss of support? So if you look at Ben Carson, after the Paris bombings, the poll numbers go down and it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. And, and so polls can have this impact rather than simply measuring public opinion at a certain point of time, they end up shaping public opinion. Uh, likewise, do polls impact fundraising? Well, yes. Uh, people who give are less likely to give if a candidate's poll numbers are going down, and they're much more likely to give if the candidate's poll numbers are going up and they look like they're a good and viable candidate. You know, Donald Trump loves polls, he says. He says, I love the polls, and he, he kind of has an obsession with the polls, and he, and he talks about the polls a lot. So do polls and exit polls keep people from voting? Well, yes, in many cases they do. And I'm going to tell you a case, uh, we'll talk about Michigan a little bit later on when we talk about the failure of polls. And I think that's one of the reasons why Michigan went for Sanders rather than Clinton's, one of many factors. We can ask the question, are polls an accurate way to um, pick debate participation? So, you know, CNN and Fox and everybody who has sponsored polls have said, we're going to let the, the candidates who poll X percent in national polls participate in the debates. And they, and they cut it off at a very precise number. Well, polls are not exact. There, there's a sampling error, a margin of error in the polls. So, in fact, um, the, the, the polls have served as a gatekeeper on who can participate in the debates rather than simply being a reflection of public opinion at any given time. So who appeared on the debate stage isn't really a scientific, scientifically accurate statement. And then do the type of polls affect results? So most polls are done through calling people on their landlines. So less than half of the population um, has a, uh, make sure I get this correct in terms of my facts, um, so, so nearly half the population is unreachable by landline. And those people who are reached, nine out of ten of them will refuse to answer questions. So it's a very small percentage of people who are um, answering these questions on a poll. You can also look at polls that are done via cell phone and you can look at statistics on who owns cell phones. So um, adults from 20 to 29 years of age, 65% of them only have a cell phone. Or adults from 30 to 34, 60% of them only have a cell phone. So a cell phone survey is going to skew toward a younger population. Uh, we know Bernie Sanders, as an example, picks up a lot of support from younger population. So. Um, the type of poll can have an impact on um, what the results end up being, actually. So Michael is going to walk us through uh, different types of polls and how polls are constructed and, and, and how they're supposed to actually work. Michael? It's a lot of things. A lot of things. <laughs> All right. Uh, so I'll, I'll just start with a, a basic overview um, of, of types of polls so that we can all have 
um, you know, a general understanding of the terminology that we're going to be using. So first of all, there, there are sort of general polls. These are the polls that you probably um, hear referred to the most in the news when they talk about the most recent poll that says this. So for example, like a CNN ORC poll is an example of a general type of poll. Um, with, caucus, um, with caucus entrance polls and exit polls, the reason that um, news organizations are doing this type of polling is really, uh, there's two reasons. First, um, they're trying to predict the outcome um, of an election as early as possible while still being right, hopefully. Um, and also, they're trying to explain why voters voted the way that they do. So for caucuses, they do entrance polls because caucuses end all at the same time, and the results are known at the immediate time that the caucuses end. So that's not very helpful when you're trying to engage in predictive analysis. So they, they poll people as they're entering the caucus sites. Um, for exit polls, they, they stand outside polling stations, and they ask people as they're exiting the voting booth who it is that they voted for and, and why. Ultimately, um, they're trying to predict as soon as possible, like I said, without um, making any serious errors. Mike's going to tell some stories in just a little bit about how uh, that doesn't always work out as planned. Um, there are uh, panel studies, um, and panel studies are um, long-term surveys where you take a group of people, for example, at the beginning of an election, and you follow them as the election progresses, and you see which issues are sort of triggering changes in their attitudes. Um, and so it gives you a more in-depth analysis of the way that individual voters are grappling with the issues and, and the content of the election. Um, there are push polls. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. These are polls that are designed not to evaluate what voters think, but they are designed, um, they're a political tool to get people to think a certain way. So they look like a poll, but they're not really a poll. So they're a poll in disguise, really. And I'll talk about why that's dangerous. And then there's tent polls that are designed to uh, hold up outdoor living facilities. <laughs> There's not a lot of room for jokes when you're doing like methods conversations, so that was my attempt. Um, so again, just to define some key terms, um, when you're doing a poll, you start with the population. That is um, the group of people whose opinions you're trying to estimate. So if I'm doing a general election poll, for example, the, the population that I'm interested in is the voting age public in the United States. Um, now, the problem is that I can't ask every voter who it is that they're going to vote for. So that necessitates taking a sample or a smaller group of that population and trying to use that smaller group to estimate the attitudes of the population as a whole. So in order to effectively do that, I have to take a representative sample. So that small group of people has to be very similar to the population um, as a whole. So the key component in getting that, um, in getting that uh, representative sample is random selection. So making sure that every person, every voter in this instance has an equal opportunity to be part of, of the study. Um, so each individual is chosen um, randomly to participate. Um, and the larger the sample size, the more accurate your estimates are going to be. So, uh, for example, take, you know, let's say that we have a jar of jelly beans. There's red, yellow, and, and green. Um, and we know like, there's 100 jelly beans. And we've put, you know, there, there's a third equal. I guess that's not possible. So let's say there's 99 jelly beans. I want to be precise here. So there's 33 each. We don't know that going in. So if we pull out five, we could get any, any random combination of, of colors. Um, but if we pull out 50, we're going to be closer to what the actual breakdown is. And if we pull out 75, we're going to be even closer. It's the same reason that if you're, you're flipping a coin, if you flip a coin you know, five times, you might get heads four times. But if you do that 200 times, you're going to get close to 50-50. Okay, so that's why a larger, uh, a larger sample size is going to be more likely to, to get you uh, more accurate results. Now, one of the challenges that Mike talked about, and you'll hear us talk about this uh, throughout the evening, is that um, it's difficult to make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to participate in your study when um, you can't reach everyone. And so this distance between cell phone users and landline users is really making it difficult for polling organizations to get an accurate representation of, of the population as a whole. 
Um, sampling error, um, so that's just the margin of error that you see um, at the bottom of a survey, so the plus or minus uh, four percentage points. Um, and, and let me give you an example of how you can estimate that. So uh, I don't like doing math. So I go to sites like this, and I could say, let's say that we have 140 people here tonight, and I want my margin of error to be plus or minus two percentage points. I would plug that into this category here. And so I would need to survey 132 of you to get that level of, of precision. Now, if I you know, just wanted to be within six percentage points, I would have to survey 92 of you. So there are ways that you determine what your sample size uh, needs to be. This is just a really simple, uh, simple calculator to, to get at that estimate. So one of the problems with, with the way that we talk about polls is that we often um, assume that they mean something when they don't. So we might look at a poll and say that, you know, this person has um, a, you know, 49%, 49% uh, of the vote, and then we have somebody who has 47% of the vote, and then there's a small amount that are undecided, but uh, the margin of error is plus or minus four percentage points. That means is that the results are in, you know, that margin of error, which means that we can't be certain uh, necessarily what those numbers represent. It could be plus or minus four percentage points for either one of those numbers. And so as you're reading polls, uh, be cautious of that. Um, polls that are not scientific. So polls that you take on Facebook are not scientific. They might be fun, uh, but, but they are not scientific. You are choosing to take those polls. Uh, you are probably taking a poll from a friend or a family member um, that you know, and uh, that means that there are a certain type of people that are uh, taking that survey, and so there's lots of reasons why that's not uh, scientific. People in the street interviews, so when the news organizations come and they start interviewing people, um, in a town after a tornado hit, for example, that is, not, uh, that is not a type of scientific analysis, and you can't generalize the way that a whole population thinks based on a few person-to-person -person interviews. I want to give you an example um, of, of a type of uh, person in the street interview that I think is, is pretty funny. Yeah. Affordable Care Act or Obamacare? 
The Affordable. And why do you prefer the Affordable Care Act over Obamacare? I just don't agree with the whole Obamacare policy thing that's going on. I just don't agree with it. And you believe that an informed citizenry is essential to a democracy? <laughs> yeah. So you disagree with Obamacare? <laughs> Do you think insurance companies should be able to exclude people with pre-existing conditions? No. Do you agree that young people should be able to stay on their parents' plans until they are 26? They should be able to, yeah. Do you agree that companies with 50 or more employees should provide health care? I do. And so by that logic, you would be for the Affordable Care Act? Yes. What plan do you support? <laughs> Obamacare? So I think you get the idea here. <laughs> so, this, this was funny, and I, I remember, you know, I was, teaching, I was teaching a class at the time that this came out, and people were showing it uh, on campus that day, and I, I think that it was, it, it created some interesting conversation, but the danger in those conversations that we were having um, was that we were assuming that was true of, of everybody, right? <laughs> people just don't know the difference between Obamacare and, and the Affordable Care Act, and we're really only looking at... A, a small group of people, so the sample size is incredibly small, and this is clearly edited, right? They, they, I'm sure that they had to find somebody on the street who would know the difference between those things, but it's not funny to include um, those moments. And so um, these are entertaining, but there's a danger in trying to generalize um, these, types of, these types of surveys. So uh, take these things with sort of a, a grain of salt. Um, when you are looking um, at, at whether a poll is, is accurate or not, one of the things that I would encourage you to do is to look at the questions that are being asked. Um, so question wording can dramatically change the way that people respond um, to a poll. So for example, um, there, were, uh, there were Roper polls from 1984 through 2006, um, and they were, they were looking at the death penalty question in a couple different ways. So you could ask people, do you support the death penalty? Or you could ask people, do you support the death penalty versus life without parole? And what they found was that there was a 20 percentage point gap. That people, when you just asked them about the death penalty, supported the death penalty 20 points or 20 percent more uh, than if you asked them um, if they supported the death penalty versus life uh, without parole. Um, and so the way that they asked that question, giving that alternative of life without parole, people responded very differently. Um, there were also a series of questions that were done by Survey uh, USA uh, after the financial collapse about what the government's proper response should be. Um, and they asked people, do you think the government should invest billions to keep the markets secure? Uh, the majority of people said yes, that, that we should do that. When asked, should we spend billions to bail out Wall Street? People said no. When asked, should we spend billions to rescue Wall Street? People said no. And so we're really talking about the same thing, but the way that we ask those questions can produce very different um, results. So when, when, you, when you talk about what we're doing as an investment, as opposed to a bailout, you're going to get very different responses. Um, likewise, the order of questions matters. So if I am doing a survey of um, attitudes toward Hillary Clinton and um, I say, you know, Hillary Clinton has taken, you know, lots of money to, you know, I ask, how do you feel about Hillary Clinton and the speeches that she gave to Wall Street? And then immediately following that, I ask you, what is your attitude about Hillary Clinton? Or if I say, Hillary Clinton um, led the fight during the Clinton administration um, to provide uh, universal health care to American citizens. How do you feel about that? And then I ask you um, how you support her or how favorable you are to her. You're likely to get very different results. And so the ordering of questions also matters. So even if the question wording is correct, the way that you choose to order those questions can have dramatic impacts on the responses as well. Um, likewise, there's a debate about whether you should include an I don't know category um, when you're asking questions. Um, and so... You know, you can imagine um, if there was an I don't know category in those uh, person on the street uh, interviews that were just taking place that some of those people might have said, I don't know. Um, and so that's why you might include that category because you don't want to measure non-attitudes. You don't want to force people to create an opinion that they don't have. Um, but on the other side, um, 
you know, researchers are wary of giving respondents an easy way out. I don't want to think about this. So I don't know. Or I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, you know, you actually want to force them to grapple with the question a little bit. And so there's a debate about whether you include those categories or not. And if you choose to do so, or you don't choose to do so, you might get very different results. Um, when you are evaluating whether pollsters are doing a good job or not, here are some things that you should look for. Here are some things that, that are signs of bad, bad polling. So you don't want to use argumentative or loaded questions. So you don't want to say, given the president's failed economic policies, dot, 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 or given Trump's lack of foreign policy experience, or Dr. Artime is a really great professor, but that one's, not, that one's not so bad. I choose to ask my questions in class that way. Oh, whoops. So you want to be careful not to word your questions in a very confusing way. So avoid things like double negatives, uh, for example. So Roper um, had a question about the Holocaust um, that they asked people. They said, does it seem possible or does it seem impossible to you that the Nazi extermination of the Jews never happened? And based on this question, they said 22% of people believe that the Holocaust might never have happened, which is scary, right? And so they, they released another question that said, does it seem possible to you that the Nazi extermination of the Jews never happened? And thankfully, you know, only about 1% of people uh, implied that the Holocaust didn't happen. That is still far too many, but it's better than, uh, better than 22%. And so... Um, the way that you phrase questions um, is, is important. Um, you want to avoid loaded questions. You also want to avoid grammatically incorrect uh, questions or confusing questions. And you also want to avoid uh, asking questions to try to get particular results. And we'll talk uh, here in just a moment about why you don't want to do that. Um, some other things that could affect uh, accuracy, the mode can affect accuracy, so we talked a little bit about that when uh, we were talking about uh, telephone uh, surveys, so the way, the method that you use to do polling can have an impact on um, the outcome of the results that you get. The timing of your poll can also be important, so if you were calling people at 3 o'clock um, in the afternoon, then you are likely to get a different demographic population than if you were to call uh, during the evening. Um, likewise, uh, the timing of the poll is important in terms of, if we're talking about elections, the electoral cycle. So a poll that is taken, um, you know, a year away from the election is less likely to be um, predictive uh, relative to a poll that was taken, you know, a couple weeks or a couple days before the election actually takes place. Um, likewise, effectively weighting the polls um, is important. So. If I was doing um, a survey of the campus population here at um, Puget Sound, and you know my survey came back, and I noticed that you know 70% of the people who were responding to my survey were men, and men were only about 50% of the campus population, then what I would need to do is is to correct for that, and so I could I could do one of two things I could weight the responses of women more heavily than, than that of men. So instead of being one person in my study, they're 1.2 people or 1.1. Um, and or, or I could remove or I, you know, I could, I could take away some of the weight of, of male responses. And so I could say that it's 0.8 of a response. And hopefully then, you know, I am correcting for some demographic imbalances um, in, in the survey that I have taken. Now, if you don't do that correctly, um, you end up with some pretty bad, bad results. And so it can be a way to correct um, for, for problems in your sample, or it can be a way that, that ultimately uh, dooms your sample to inaccurately reflect uh, the population that you're trying to study. Um, so I said I would get back to this. This is push polling. Again, push polling is, uh, is a poll that is designed to influence the way that voters think. So it looks like a regular poll, um, but, it, but it's not actually that. And so T. Watts, who is a Columbia consultant and pollster, um, who argues that uh, push polls are unfair, uh, was interviewed and said this. He was talking in reference to the 2000 Republican primary um, election in, in South Carolina. Um, and he was talking about specifically the Bush campaign's tactics against John McCain. 
He said, they'd ask who you're voting for if you said Bush. They'd say, that's great, be sure to vote. You'd hang up thinking it was just an, a normal get out the vote call. But if you said McCain, they'd ask a litany of questions. Would you vote for McCain if you knew, dot, dot, dot. Basically, they would just throw the book at him. Watts could tell when the calls peaked about a week before the vote because everybody started talking about it. It was like a waterfall. Um, one of the questions, and I should say that, that the person who is, is, is famous for conducting these or the person that this is associated with is, is Karl Rove. He's a Republican political operative. Um, his nickname is Turd Blossom. That was a nickname given to him by George W. Bush. It's based on a flower that sprouts out of uh, cattle manure. Um, and so uh, he, is, he is specifically known for his, uh, his ability to get down and dirty uh, during a campaign. And so he is closely associated with these types of campaign tactics. One of the questions that they asked, um, asked voters, would you be more or less likely to vote for John McCain if you knew he had fathered an illegitimate black child? They asked that question because family pictures of, of uh, McCain's family um, showed a picture of this young woman here. She is their adopted daughter from Bangladesh. And so they were trying to insinuate something. Um, about his family, starting rumors um, on the ground which might influence the way that people voted. Republicans are not the only ones that do this, though. This is a ad that, th this was a poll that was sent to Mike, um, actually, recently, so I just took a, a picture of it. Um, and it's clearly not trying to scientifically study the way that voters think. So the, the top question here, if you can't see it, says Republicans have blocked legislation to close a loophole that has allowed more than 2,000 people on the FBI's terrorist watch list to buy guns in the United States over the past 11 years. Do you support the Democrats' efforts to close this loophole to keep guns out of the hands of suspected terrorists? So do you or do you not want terrorists to have guns? Is the question. Another question later on about Social Security says, despite a volatile stock market and public opposition, Republicans remain determined to privatize Social Security. Do you support privatization? So, are you an idiot? <laughs> given what we've told you, given what we've told you, how close are you to an idiot? Um, so that, that's essentially what they're asking there. And so they're not, these, these polls are not going to be used to estimate what voters think. They're designed to get you to think something. They're priming their voters to get angry about certain issues so that they go out and vote, right? Or that they give money. Specifically, that's, that's what I think they wanted to do in this poll. So some changes um, in, in polling in the last several years, um, and I think really positive changes. Um, Real Clear Politics was sort of a monumental development in polling. Um, it is, uh, to my mind, I think the first, uh, first really big poll aggregator. So what they did was they took polls from a lot of different sources, averaged them together um, so that you could get a sense of where races were. Um, to say that we shouldn't put too much emphasis on any given poll, we should average them together and that gives us a better sense. And I think um, 538.com, Nate Silver's website, uh, went one step further with that. They, um, they actually weighted polls based on how accurate they were. So they said, we're not just going to average all polls together as if all polls are equal. We're going to do weighting, what I was talking about before. And we're going to say that polls that have a history of accuracy are going to be weighted more heavily. Um, in, our, in our averages. And some polls that are really bad, we're going to get rid of them altogether. And so when they are doing, um, when they are doing their averaging, um, they, they grade polls. And you can check this out um, on their website. They have, um, I'll just go over a couple of their points. They talk about whether, you know, a poll is better if they call cell phones. So if there's a dot there, that means the poll calls cell phones. Also, whether they're accredited with a public opinion research group. Um, the polls analyzed, they look at um, polls before elections, um, three weeks before an election. So they look at House, Senate, gubernatorial, and presidential elections. So polls three weeks in advance of those. And at, that was as of 1998. So they took, all, they took a look at all the polls after 1998. Um, and they looked at polls from 2000 in relation to presidential primaries and caucuses, um, three weeks out from those, those elections. Um, this simple average error is just an estimate of the, the uh, average of those polls um, compared to the actual result. 
so how different the polls were from the actual result. Um, they look at, um, over here, uh, things like uh, this mean reverted bias says how skewed are they towards Democratic or Republican candidates. So if you look here, uh, this uh, Rasmussen poll um, overestimates support for Republican candidates by about 2.3 percentage points, whereas Research 2000 um, overestimates support for Democratic candidates by about 1.4 1 1 .4 percentage points. That's actually such a bad poll that they have given it an F and they've banned it, they said. So, um, so they don't treat all polls equally. And one of the things that I really like uh, about this site is that I think that it is... Uh, it, you know, it does a good job of teaching you the, the language of polling, and it makes polling um, accessible. So it says, here are the things that you should be looking at um, when you are looking at whether a poll is good or not. They don't do their own polling. Um, they are an analysis of polls that are conducted by, um, by other research groups. So we're going to return to a discussion of, of 538 here in just a little bit. Um, but before we do that, I want to turn things over to Mike, who's going to tell us about um, some of the great failures um, in polling in, in our history. Thank you, Michael. So failures in polling, it's all scientific, right? So how, how could it uh, go wrong? Well, um, in the days before scientific polling, the way in which uh, people figured out what public opinion was was through straw polls. And straw polls were done mainly through newspapers and magazines. So 1824 was the first presidential straw poll. You had four major candidates. John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, William Crawford, and Henry Clay. Um, it was conducted by the, the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania newspaper, but interestingly, they polled people in Delaware. And um, so the poll got the order of the candidates right. So they predicted Jackson would be in first place with 70%, followed by John Quincy Adams, followed by Henry Clay, and then William Crawford. They just got the numbers wrong, uh, significantly wrong. Jackson didn't have the 70%, he had 41.4%. Adams had more than the 23% they predicted, and Clay and Crawford were significantly off. They got a lot more. The problem with 1824, of course, was that none of these candidates had a majority of votes in the Electoral College. Because straw polls, as well as just regular scientific sampling polls, generally don't take into account the intricacies of the Electoral College. So, end of the day, Jackson had the most number of votes in the Electoral College, but not a majority. Therefore, the election went to the House of Representatives. Who chose John Quincy Adams? Um, Henry Clay shifted all of his support to Adams. That's how Adams won. Jackson called that a corrupt bargain, and it was a big bruja. And uh, but anyway, rate, that was. Uh, they got the order right, but not the specifics. 1936, we're, we're getting closer to uh, more scientific sampling polls, but still this was a straw poll. Literary Digest magazine for four previous presidential elections had had a straw poll, and they had predicted those accurately. So 1936, they decided to do this even bigger. So they send out 10 million cards to people. They send it out to their subscribers. They send it out to automobile registration uh, people, people who own automobiles, people who have a telephone. Uh, they get 2.4 million responses back, and the prediction is Alf Landon is going to beat Franklin Roosevelt, 57% to 43%. Now, but when you look at the people that they surveyed, people who can afford a magazine subscription, who can afford a car, who can afford a telephone, those tend to be wealthier people, they tend to skew more toward Republicans, and therefore that's why they got the results that they did. So there was no scientific sample here, it was just volume. They also didn't train their tabulators, and so there were errors in that process. So this kind of blew a hole in the whole straw poll thing. It also blew a hole in the Literary Digest and faith in them, and they were bankrupt a year later. 1948 is probably the biggest failure of polls. So two months before the 1948 election between Thomas Dewey and Harry Truman, um, a very prominent uh, pollster, uh, Elmo Roper, stopped 
polling. He said, I'm not going to do any more polls. He said, Thomas Dewey is almost as good as elected. I can think of nothing duller or more intellectually barren than acting like a sports announcer who feels he must pretend he is witnessing a neck and neck race. So he stopped polling. So he did start doing some polls about a week before the election, but it still showed Dewey with an edge. And um, so, of course, what they didn't take into account was the fact that Truman was uh, whistle-stopping across the country, 31,000 miles across the country, back of a train, campaigning hard. Um, it didn't take into account last-minute decisions. And, of course, you know, the famous picture Truman took great delight in the Chicago uh, Daily Tribune printing an early edition saying, you know, Dewey defeats Truman. Everybody knew that Dewey was going to win. Uh, the polls all showed it. Uh, the Gallup polls, in fact, um, in September, again, two months before, showed Dewey at 46 percent um, and, and Truman at 38 percent. So a, a large failure in the polls. Now, end of the day, Truman ended up getting 49.6 percent, Dewey 45.1 percent. What none of that reflects, of course, is the Electoral College. So Truman, 303 votes to 189 for Dewey to 39 for Strom Thurmond on the Dixiecrat third party. But the interesting thing is how the election could have been so much different. There were three key states, um, Ohio, Illinois, and California, that together had 78 electoral votes. In each of those three states, Truman won by less than 1%. If that had flipped in all three states to Dewey, Dewey would have won the Electoral College. If it had flipped in two of those three states to Dewey, the election would have been thrown into the House of Representatives. So less than 1%. That's like 58,000 votes out of 48 million cast. So it, it, very, very small margins there. In 2012, the Iowa caucus, Republican Iowa caucus, um, Everybody said Rick Santorum, uh, it's about a week before or days before the caucus, Santorum at 16.3%. He ends up winning the caucus at 24.6%. Doesn't take into account last minute decisions. It also doesn't take into account that it's really hard to do polls on caucus states. Caucuses, you get a very small percentage of registered voters who end up showing up. So it's very difficult to do accurate polling on that. And then this year, the Michigan primary on the Democratic side, a huge failure in the polls. So Real Clear Politics, uh, a few days before, showed Clinton at 55% to Sanders 37.3%. The actual vote had Sanders ahead 49.8% versus 483 Want to go over five possible reasons why did this happen this way. So one is the polls underestimated a number of populations. They underestimated the youth vote, they underestimated independence, and they underestimated the number of blacks who would go for Sanders. Um, secondly, there were very few polls that were done after Sunday before the primary, and therefore it didn't pick up late uh, minute decisions for Sanders. Um, thirdly, some Clinton supporters may have decided to vote strategically. They knew Clinton was far in advance. Uh, Michigan is an open primary state, so you could vote in the Republican side. And so maybe some of them voted for Tr against Trump to stop Trump. So that's another thing. A fourth factor is some Clinton supporters may have said, why vote? Clinton's way ahead in the lead, got the lead on this, and so they may not have shown up at the, uh, at the polls. And then finally, um, Michigan didn't have a big history of Democratic uh, primary votes, so they didn't have a, an ability to really construct accurate polls. In 2016, Gallup, who is the premier polling uh, company, has said that they are not going to do polling on presidential candidates. And, and they said that because in 2012, their polls were very far off of the actuals. And they decided they wanted to figure out 
what was wrong with their methodology and how could they get more accurate. They have not yet released polls, so they're still trying to figure that out. Maybe they're doing polling and they're looking to see have they figured out what their, their errors and methodology are. But um, it, it just points to the fact that polling is, um, while it's a science, there's some art to it. And, and we've got a changing society as well in terms of how do you reach people. Um, so that's an interesting piece about polling. Michael, tell us about uh, election forecasting and how is that different from polling? All right, uh, so I want to, to briefly describe the difference between forecasting and polling. So polling, um, and Mike used this language before, is really just a snapshot in time. So you're just saying what people think about a candidate, an institution, an issue in that moment in which you're polling. Um, now, what you are not measuring is what is going to happen in the future. So the attempt to use polls to predict what is going to happen in the future, that's, that's forecasting in the same way that we think of you know, weather persons predicting what the weather is going to be like tomorrow. They're trying to tell you what is going to um, happen in the future. So we, you know, we magically do that as, as political scientists sometimes. Um, so again, polls are not inherently predictive. Um, when you're talking about, um, when you're talking about uh, predicting what's going to happen in an election, that requires that you create a certain set of assumptions. So you have to first and foremost decide who is likely to vote. Um, so you need to not just think about what the public in general thinks about candidates, but you need to think about who is likely to turn out um, on, on election day. That means you also have to do things like decide what to do with undecideds. Do you toss them out entirely, even though some of them are likely to pick a candidate um, to vote for going forward? Um, you know, how do you determine um, how likely these undecideds are to vote and what you should do with them? Um, additionally, um, th there are other factors which make, um, which make prediction difficult. Um, and so uh, I'll just give you one of those here. So uh, it's known as the Bradley effect. It is named after um, LA mayor, um, former LA mayor Tom Bradley, um, who was running for governor of California. Um, he was leading in the polls. He was, he was a black man. Um, and ultimately, he lost the election. And people were asking, you know, why was he doing so well in the polls and why did he lose then on, on election day? And the argument was, that he lost because people were trying to give the socially desirable response. That they were saying, yes, I will vote for him even though he is black, um, even though they weren't going to do that um, in reality. And so this was known as the Bradley effect. A lot of people were afraid um, that this was what was going to happen um, in 2008 to Obama, that he was going to be doing really well in the polls, but when it came time um, for people to actually vote, that we would have overestimated his support because we wouldn't be taking this into account. Thankfully, that wasn't the case um, in either 2008 or 2012 as we've looked um, retroactively at the polls versus how Obama did um, on election day. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't still be concerned about this, uh, these attempts to give a socially desirable um, answer. Uh, this is a quote from um, Dilbert creator uh, Scott Adams, who was writing recently about uh, Hillary Clinton um, on his blog. He said, a big chunk of Democratic men might be lying for social reasons about supporting Clinton. They might lie to friends and they might lie to pollsters, but on voting day in the privacy of the voting booth, no lying is required. On voting day, people vote for identity. And so his argument is that maybe this Bradley effect not only applies to, to race, but perhaps it applies to gender um, as well. And so that is something which I would encourage you to, uh, to pay attention to uh, during, this, during this election cycle. So let's return briefly to, uh, to Nate Silver um, in, in 538. So as I told you, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of what they do. Um, and I preface that because I'm going to be a little bit critical here. Um, and so uh, he, he's, he's shown a tremendous track record for predicting general election results. So in 2008, he picked 49 of 50 states correctly. In 2012, he gained a lot of notoriety for, for predicting all 50 states and how they would vote. Um, and so he garnered a, a lot of attention, and so did his website. Um, but at the beginning of this election cycle, he was cautioning people um, not to freak out about Trump. Um, he was saying things like, for example, this, this, uh, this chart 
um, shows uh, 2008 and 2012 in how uh, most people were not searching on Google about the election until about, um, you know, until it was a, uh, about 10 weeks before the election. So his argument was, look, you're, you're worrying about something that's really far away. When people start paying attention, there's no way they're going to support Trump. And so as the election went on, you know, he continued to write about this. He posted on, on Twitter uh, this comment, basically Trump is the nickelback of presidential candidates, disliked by most, super popular with a few. Um, he also wrote an article uh, detailing the six stages of Trump's collapse said that essentially there were going to be six things that would happen and that would lead to his demise. And he kind of talked through what that would look like. And he said at the end of that article, so how do I wind up with that 2% estimate that Trump's nom of nomination chances? It's what you get if you assume he has a 50% chance of surviving each subsequent stage of the gauntlet. Um, tonight's debate could prove to be the beating of the end for Trump or he could remain a factor for months to come, but he's almost certainly doomed sooner or later. And so, uh, it's not to criticize what he does, but just to point out that when we are engaging in prediction, there's a certain set of assumptions um, that we take into consideration. It's, in it's impossible to be entirely um, unbiased, and it's impossible to predict with 100% accuracy. He was making the assumption that a candidate like Trump could not win that a candidate who says the things that he does, that's as unpopular within the party as he is, could not win. And that assumption is built into the models that he creates. And it's built into his interpretation of the results that he gets. And so it is impossible for us to remove assumptions um, from this process. There's nothing that's inherently wrong with the, the way that he's analyzing the data, um, but the problem existed in, in those assumptions. Um, a gentleman named, uh, this is another example of some, some predictions that are occurring um, in, in this particular election. So Helmut Norpoth, who uh, is a political science professor at Stony Brook uh, in New York, uh, he is part of the political forecasting group at the American Political Science Association. Um, I, was, I was part of that group for a little while. Uh, he is making the argument that Trump is almost assuredly going to win. Um, the, the presidential election based on his model. So he takes into account um, cyclical patterns in U.S. elections, things like after a party has been in power for uh, two terms in a row, then it is very likely that the other party will take control um, after that. So if you look since 1960, the only time where that hasn't happened is in 1988. Um, he also looks at primary performance and how candidates do uh, during the primary process. And he has ended up, uh, he said that his model has been correct since 1912, other than the 1960 presidential election. And he says that that means that there is a 96% chance that Donald Trump is going to be the nominee of his party. And then when he projects forward to the general election, he says that, uh, that Trump will win a general election um, 87 percent of the time against Clinton and 99 percent of the time against Sanders. That is his model. Now, I think that I think this is an interesting model, um, but you have to remember that despite the fact that it's been a hundred years, we're still talking about a really small sample size, and this model doesn't take into consideration the whole other confluence of factors which might influence the outcome of an election. But you know, this, this is his model, so perhaps, you know, he is, he, is entirely, uh, he is entirely accurate about this. And that's, the, that's one of the difficult things when you're trying to predict elections, especially presidential elections. You are working with a really small sample size. You're looking at only a, a small handful um, of elections. So if we're talking about 100 years, you're talking about 25 elections. And if I did a poll of 25 people on campus, I could not argue that that poll is reflective of the way that the student population here thinks. And so we're talking about a really small, really small sample. Um, there are others who say that you don't need to look at anything else to predict the outcome of an election. You just need to look at the economy. So, you know, if you think about uh, James Carville, who was the um, political analyst who worked for, uh, worked for the Clinton campaign, uh, Bill Clinton's campaign, he said, it's the, it's the economy, stupid. That's how he described 
what election results were going to look like. And so uh, this model here, this is from a statistician, Franz Liska, and he says that um, if unemployment rates rise or stay flat or inch lower by the smallest possible margin of 0.1 percentage points, the opposition wins. And that's these elections in red. And if unemployment decreases by at least 0.2 percentage points, the incumbent wins. The incumbent party wins. It says that's just the way that it works. You don't need to look at other factors. Just look at the state of the economy. That'll tell you who's going to win an election. That's, that's the argument. That's this forecasting. Now to, to the fun stuff. So there, there are these things known as, as prediction markets. I'm going to give you a couple different examples of this. This is uh, CNN's prediction market. And essentially, it is, it is a group of people betting in some way about what is going to happen in an election. And so on CNN, they have this prediction market right now. Um, earlier this week, um, the prediction market said 80, there was an 82% chance that the GOP convention was going to fail to produce a nominee on the first vote. Um, individuals could go in uh, to this site and they could bet whether or not the odds would go up or down over time. Now this, this, uh, this betting could just get you prizes. And that's lame. So what we really want to do is win a lot of money. <laughs> I know that's what you're interested in. So it's my guide to striking it rich. Obviously, I am very wealthy. That is why I'm here in front of you today. <laughs> so you can go to, for example, the Betfair site. And you can go to this uh, politics section. Go to US presidential election. You can look at, for example, who the Democratic nominee is going to be. Well, right now, let's say I'm going to bet on Hillary Clinton to win. I'm going to bet $1,000. That's going to give me a dollar twelve to every you know every dollar that I bet. I'm going to make a profit of um, $120. So, you know, if you're super confident, go home and have fun tonight. I'm not endorsing this. This is not endorsing gambling. Um, but it's something that you can do. And what's really interesting is people use these uh, prediction markets um, to gauge how an election is going. And so if you look at how people are betting, people say that that's actually a pretty good predictor of what's going to happen. Because the people that are betting are people that know a lot. Like, if you're going to put... <laughs> If you're going to put money down on an election, you probably know more than the average voter. And so the argument is then, you know, these, these things tend to be right. You know, think about how often, you know, they, they don't, have, like sports books don't exist for no reason. They would go out of business if they were wrong a lot. So people that lay the odds on these things, you know, they, they're more likely going to be, to be right than they're going to be. So how do we know if this is ultimately successful or not? So let me tell you uh, just, just really quick uh, a couple stories here. So in 1996, uh, CBS News predicted an 18-point margin of victory um, for, for President Clinton. The actual margin of victory was 8 percentage points, so they were 10 percentage points off. In 2000, Gallup poll, um, actually 2004, uh, Gallup poll predicted that Kerry would win, um, but they were 2 percentage points off. Ultimately, you know, Gallup poll gets killed here, right? They were wrong. CBS News, you know, they were just a little bit off. <laughs> you know, you're talking about a 10-point difference versus a 2-point difference. But what mattered was, you know, who ultimately was right. And so we view election predictions in a different, in a different way. Um, and, and, and just to kind of sum up here, I think that um, election poll, uh, uh, you know, polling is, is an incredibly important thing. It's something that, that I personally um, believe in. And there's a quote um, which kind of stuck with me. Um, it is by um, a gentleman named uh, Sidney Verba, who is uh, who's from Harvard. Uh, he, is, he was a uh, former president of the American Political Science Association. And he was talking, uh, he talked um, about 
why, uh, why polling is important. So let me just read you what he says uh, in closing. He says, citizen participation is the main way which the public communicates its needs and preferences to the government and induces the government to be responsive. Since participation depends on resources and resources are unequally distributed, the resulting communication is a biased representation of the public. Thus, the democratic ideal of equal consideration is violated. Sample surveys provide the closest approximation to an unbiased representation of the public because participation in a survey requires no resources and because surveys eliminate the selection bias inherent in the fact that, inherent in the fact that participants in politics are self-selected. So to, to summarize that, what he's saying is that polls are a really democratic tool. You know, we think about all of these, uh, you, know, you know, if you think about money in elections, a lot of people get discouraged about uh, money in elections and, and the outsized uh, influence that, that big corporations or super PACs have. Um, but one way that individuals can get involved with no money or no resources is to take the time and answer some questions on a survey. And that ultimately has a big impact. We know that policy decisions are made based on opinion polls. The people decide which candidates to give money to based on how people are doing in the polls. Um, and so it's one way that individuals, regardless of how many resources they have, can get involved in politics. So if you get called um, and you are asked to participate in a survey, uh, you know, be that 10% of, of people who say, who say yes. Um, so next time. We're going to be talking about media, marketing, and the making of the president. Um, so join us on April 28th uh, for that. Um, next week, um, I'd like to, to give a plug for a um, debate that's going to occur in, uh, in this room on Wednesday at 7 o'clock, April 20th. Um, the UPS debate team is going to be debating this topic. The United States federal government should make community college a tuition-free option for all. Um, and it's going to be a, a great debate. You're gonna, you would get a chance to see some of um, the excellent debaters who are part, uh, who are part of the team here. Um, and, and I think that you'll, I think you'd really enjoy it. Um, and, and I would encourage you to come out here and, and support them. So they are, they are one of the driving factors behind uh, the creation of this program uh, here. So if you, if you want to show your support for, for this uh, to us, I would encourage you to come out. Uh, and watch that, watch that debate next week. That, I know that would mean a lot to the students. Um, it's free, but they're, they're accepting donations to, to the program. Um, that being said, uh, join us uh, a couple weeks from now, as well as uh, during our bonus lecture. And now, I think we're open for questions. Questions, yes. So the question is, what makes me say that Bernie Sanders won't win the 68% of the remaining delegates that he needs to win the nomination? Um, a couple of things. One is that uh, he has not, to date, demonstrated that uh, level of support. And then the second thing is I think Sanders is hindered by the fact that he has a very small percentage of uh, support from the superdelegates on the Democratic side. So 710 superdelegates, Sanders has roughly 30, Clinton is 400, 450, something like that. Um, so I think his path to the, to the nomination is, um, is a difficult one. Yeah, and it also yeah. has to do with um, the fact that on the Democratic side, all of the states um, divide up their delegates proportionally. So even if, for example, in a state like, uh, like New York, he does much better than expected. He's, he's down in the polls right now. If he were to win there, that would certainly be a big deal for the campaign. But you know, even if he were to win by one or two percentage points, um, he still isn't going to pick up that much in terms of delegates. It would be about evenly split. And so that makes it really difficult. Yeah, good point. If it were a winner-take-all situation, his chances would be higher. Yeah. 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 Yes? whatever polling he was paying attention to, because in 2012, he was doing a victory lap for the last two weeks of the, uh, of the campaign. Yeah. And he got beaten by almost what, 10 percent. So the question relates to uh, 2012 and Mitt Romney, and what did Romney get so wrong about his polling data, and, and why did he uh, lose? 
Michael, do you have any insights well, into that? Well, you know, I would say I don't think that the I, I don't think that most of the polls um, said that he was going to win by a lot. They were predicting a close um, election. Um, but you also have to remember, if you watch the way the candidates approach polls um, at times, they, they do so in a fairly optimistic way. You're looking for polls, uh, you know, that, that support your your argument, um, right? And, and things, you know, these are these are people that are that are running for uh, running for office, and so the natural tendency is to, to like the polls that say you're doing well, to dismiss the polls that say you're doing uh, you're doing poorly. Um, the problem, you know, is that it's not you're not looking at national polls either. You're looking at polling in a handful of battleground states. Um, and so, you know, he, he was not blowing Obama out in those, in those battleground states, even though it was fairly neck and neck um, in the popular vote. Yes? This morning on NPR, uh, there was a small segment of a Republican delegate chairman from North, North Dakota said that the rules in the Republican uh, National Convention, that, that they're not bound to vote in that first ballot, that they're totally free to vote for their conscience. And he, he repeated that several times, that there was no rule in the rules that said that they were bound to vote for the person that won their, their caucus. So the, the comment in question relates to an NPR piece today. Uh, with a chairman of North Dakota Republican uh, uh, party and th that said that Republican rules don't require a candidate or a delegate to vote for who won the primary or caucus on the first ballot. Um, I think what we have to remember here is that each state is different. Um, and, and so I know North Dakota has some unique pieces which I can't remember what it is. Some delegates, 95% of the delegates who go to the Republican convention are going to be bound on that first ballot to who ended up winning the caucus or the primary. Um, and then after that, uh, you know, the, they become uncommitted on the second and the third ballot. Um, so you got 5% that do have flexibility. So that could be what they were referring to. Um, I didn't hear that piece, so I, I'm, I'm not sure. It was across the board to everybody. Yeah, and, and that, that's not what I've heard that it's, uh, uh, you know, I've heard this 95% of the Republican delegates are bound on the first ballot. Uh, yes? You hear about organizations, polling organizations that are Democratic polling organizations, Republican polling organizations. Do these organizations, the companies that do run the polls for them, um, Mean kind of one way politically, you think strongly, or is it that in a given year a company may be hired by the Democrats or hired by the Republicans? Is there a great deal of you can you can say about what the organizations are? Yeah. So the question gets at uh, polling companies who might be hired by the Democratic Party or the Republican Party in a particular year, and kind of how valid are those polls, and does the fact that they're hired by uh, particular party, how does that shape um, the, the accuracy of the polls? Michael? Yeah, well, um, I mean, certainly um, campaigns have their, uh, you know, have a lot of internal polling. So they, they hire people to do um, internal polling. Except and the those, Trump campaign has no pollster. The, which, the Trump campaign yeah, has yeah, no pollster. Yeah, yeah, they don't have a They yeah. don't have much right. of an, an organization. But they... Uh, <laughs> They're hiring people now, so I guess that's that's okay. Um, but yeah, they don't. You know, um, there are, a lot of the campaigns have their own um, internal internal polling, and so when you see candidates on election night look really confident, sometimes that's because they uh, they've been hearing from their internal pollsters 
um, what is likely to happen. And they, they, they sometimes are, are fairly accurate um, in that they have access to information that news organizations might not. They have people who are on the ground and polling or caucus sites who are reporting uh, back to them to help supplement the information that they have. And so, um, so they, can be, they can be very accurate. Um, but I do think that you need to be wary of polls that have um, a, a clear partisan bias. That's one of the knocks against like the Rasmussen poll that I was, I was mentioning before. You know, they have a bad rap for overestimating the support of Republican candidates. And those are not, that's not a poll that is, you know, that they're not paid by, um, by Republicans, but, uh, but they, they do tend to overestimate the support um, of, of that party and that party's candidates. Yes. Can you guys say, yeah. Can you guys shed any light for us on what on the clips we saw in Arizona of the huge discrepancies in the primaries there, and the, the, the massive um, city hall meeting that really attacked the mayor of Phoenix for all kinds of what looked like major discrepancies and and removal of the, the, the uh, registrations. Uh, documents of people by the thousands. So the question relates to um, voter discrepancies in the Arizona primary and uh, kind of can we shed any light on those? Michael, do you have any insights? I, I really wish I could. I, yeah. saw, uh, I saw a headline um, about Arizona being sued earlier today, but, um, <laughs> but I haven't had a chance to, to read it yet, so I would refrain from commenting on it at this point, but um, but ask it next. Ask the question next time we're going to talk about it. Uh, yes, in the back. You. Yes. So you know you hinted at some of the dangers of polling and like the negative effects of polling. Um, could you maybe elaborate on that? I mean, I'm thinking of things like you know you can't come into the debate because you're at X amount of percentage. Yeah. And mainly around the ideas of it like actually limiting democracy and like mm -hmm. the effects of that. Like Canada has a system where they actually regulate the polling but there's no regulation here, so anything can be published. So I just wanted to hear kind of thoughts around the effect, negative effects on democracy for that matter. Sure. So the question relates to uh, the negative effects on democracy of the polling with uh, specific reference to what we talked about in terms of the debate, uh, you know, who gets to participate in the debates. And so, you know, Michael talked about the uh, sampling error, the margin of error in polls, and depending on how many people have been polled, is going to depend on how accurate that poll is likely to be. And so the news organizations that were sponsoring uh, debates, they said, you know, a candidate has to have at least 5% or whatever percent they, they indicated. Well, but because polls have this uh, error margin here, that means some of the candidates who didn't make it onto the main stage and were in the undercard uh, debate, um, you know, that wasn't really a scientific process. So to that extent, yes, it was limiting the conversation and limiting uh, who could actually participate. Now, would that ever really change things um, in, in terms of those candidates who were at the low poll numbers? Had they been on the main stage, would they have all of a sudden, you know, been shining stars and, you know, their poll numbers would have gone up and they would have won? You know, doubtful, but uh, yeah. But, but we have to remember that polls do impact things. They're not simply a reflection of opinion at a given time. That's what they're designed to be, but they have these uh, kind of ripple effects oftentimes. Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would add a couple things um, to that as well. I think that um, there's, there's been a lot of discussion in political science when we talk about the media about um, the danger of talking about the election too much as a horse race, and so focusing on who's winning and who's losing, and what can the person who's losing do to get ahead, and what can the person who's ahead do to fall well, to fall back behind, um, and so when we focus on those sort of gamesy aspects of a campaign, then we can lose sight of the substance, and so I think that's the danger of a preoccupation with polling. Um, it does, as Mike's saying, influence the election in a lot of ways. I mean, what we know is that um, you know statistically, super PACs, you know large donors, they are likely to give money to candidates that they think are going to win, and they they evaluate that based on the polls. And so uh, you know, the the idea ultimately for these groups is that they want to have influence in government, and it you don't get influence in government by betting on a loser, 
And so they look at polls and they give money to them and it sort of creates this, you know, self-fulfilling prophecy at that point. And so I think that's a way in which polls can, can influence elections a little bit. Okay. Yes. Is there another kind of poll that politicians use to determine their speeches and platforms? Mm -hmm. mm, great question. Is there another kind of poll that uh, politicians use to determine their speeches and their platforms? Um, Michael, do you want to take a shot at it? Or I well, I mean, they, they can do polls. They, they can also do uh, focus groups, which is a fairly common thing. So you'll take a, a small group of people, and it'll be more conversational, where you bring them into the room, and you test out different words or different phrases and see what tests well, and you might do that with many different, uh, many different groups. Um, and so that's one of the ways that, that they go about that process. Yeah, and the other thing is, I mean, pollsters don't just poll, you know, which candidate do you support, but they poll on issues. So politicians are going to pay attention to those issue polls. You know, 67% of the people think X. Okay, well, maybe I need to shift my position on that. So, um, and, and Michael was giving some examples of some of those issue-related polls earlier. Um, so, yes, that, that, that could have an impact. Yes, sir. Someone asserted earlier that uh, Cruz has a good staff and Trump doesn't. That's known about uh, Bernie Sanders, too. What's the effect historically of a politician's staff on winning elections? So the question relates to what, what is the impact of a candidate's staff and their organization on being able to win an election? And the example of of course, is uh, Trump, who does not have a particularly good organization, and Cruz does. Um, I, I think it is critical. I mean, Barack Obama won in 2008 because he had a good organization. He had a good ground game. So more and more now, of course, the use of technology. Um, how do you use technology? How do you figure out who your supporters are? How do you target them? How do you get them actually out to vote? Um, so you can have a candidate who's got... Um, great ideas and, and very popular, but if they're not organized, so campaigns have become very much a scientific um, strategy, and uh, you've got to have that organization to win. That's one of the difficulties that Trump is facing right now, as you know, he's ahead in the, the delegates, but, um, you know, Cruz is kind of uh, outshining him on some of the backroom things about how delegates are actually selected, and that could be critical. Um, at the convention, because this could come down to just a few votes as to whether Trump has a majority um, at the convention on the first ballot. So organization is critical. Okay. Other questions? Yes. Uh, so do you think that Clinton campaign is concerned at all about polls? Or, I mean, she, she doesn't seem to like be talking about that much. So it seems to me that she's pretty secure in her plan what she's doing that she's not really verbalizing anything about polls? Yeah, so the question relates to is the Clinton campaign uh, concerned about polls and to what extent are they responding to it? So Clinton, of course, has a very high unfavorability rating, um, not, not as high of an unfavorability rating as Trump and Cruz do. Um, and it'd be pretty hard to get higher than that, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, nationally, you know, I, I showed you the real clear politics average. So um, Clinton and Sanders are very close. Now, so much of this really depends on a state-by-state -state analysis, though. And how do they do? Um, and Because the Democrats are all proportional in terms of how they award the delegates. So I think Clinton follows the polls, and it, or her staff does, and they know about it. I think she's um, just kind of pushing her message, and um, I, I think there have been some things where she has adapted, and all candidates do this. They adapt based on what seems to work and what they see as different. At one point in time, um, if you listen to Clinton's speeches, she talked a lot about I, and, and, and at one point in time, there's more of a shift, and she started talking about we, and if you, and if you listen to other candidates, there's more of this uh, you know, collective we. And, and that makes a difference. And, and we're going to talk about some of that next uh, time on April 28th when we look at uh, slogans, campaign slogans of candidates, and uh, how does that impact things. 
there was a really funny uh, moment earlier on in the early in the campaign um, from the Clintons. They had gotten some polling data that they wanted her to be, you know, people wanted her to be more spontaneous. So we plan on being more spontaneous in the future. <laughs> so she pays attention to the polls. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. One more? Yes, sir. Question for a historian. Yeah. Um, I've seen something in politics this year that I have never seen before. Usually a candidate is for or against something. They have a point of view, and they talk content. Even if, even if they're Tea Party, I don't want any, but at least there's something. Trump is the first candidate I've ever seen who has very little content, and it seems like he's captured a population percentage very much on personality. And I was trying to think back, it, has there been in the past a candidate like Trump? I can't remember any of Okay, so the question, uh, the direct question is, has there ever been a candidate like Trump? Uh, <laughs> No, but, but to go more specifically in terms of uh, candidates that are based more on personality versus issues. So we have had candidates who have been personality-based candidates. Uh, so 1912, Theodore Roosevelt running uh, on the progressive third-party ticket, the Bull Moose Party, uh, was very much a personality-driven issue. Now, Theodore Roosevelt also had policy positions, too. Uh, Donald Trump is kind of devoid of a lot of those. Um, but, but so Theodore Roosevelt, the, the progressive party, the Bull Moose Party, didn't uh, survive after Theodore Roosevelt because it was all driven and built around him. And, and that tends to be what happens with third party candidates, to be sure. Um, here we've got a very larger than life candidate uh, running for one of the major party's nominations. Um, very much personality driven. So uh, direct answer to your question, no. I don't think we've seen anything uh, directly like this. Uh, we, we have some rough parallels, but they're, they're, they're not really good parallels. So, so we're going to stick around a little bit. Uh, if you've got further questions or comments, uh, I encourage you to come out uh, April 28th in two weeks, and we'll talk about uh, media marketing and the making of the president. Thank you.